Welcome to a new episode of Impact TV, live from Impact, a center for media culture in Utrecht. My name is Michelle, and this is Friso. Hi, and everybody. <laughs> together, we are part of the Impact TV editorial board, selecting the topics for this monthly series of events. So in previous Impact TV episodes, we talked about, for instance, NFTs of conspiracy theories. And tonight uh, is a turn to a very hysteric topic. Um, but before um, we go to our guest, to a special guest, uh, I would like to welcome you as well to Planet Impact. Um, this is our new online environment where we have our online events. Uh, if you are watching from YouTube or from Facebook, then uh, check it out, planet.impact.nl. Next to the live stream, you will find there also a floor with a lot of extra content and for after uh, this event, uh, you can join us in the Zoom rooftop bar for some after talk and virtual drinks. Uh, under the live stream, you can find buttons to ask questions. So throughout the, um, the broadcast, you can ask questions via chat, live chat, or via email through questions at impact.nl. And now I give the word to Friso. Ah, thank you very <laughs> much, Michelle. Um, well, Michelle touched on it. Tonight's theme is hysteria. Uh, we've experienced a lot of hysteria over the last few months, one might say, but it's not something totally new to our societies. Actually, it has been something that is perhaps defining our societies, at least in the view of Mark Schuilenburg, our special guest this evening. He recently published this book, Hysteria, Crime, Media and Politics. And we thought it was an interesting read, so we thought, why not invite Mark Schadeberg for a presentation here at Impact TV? We're very happy he accepted, and he is actually with us already, looking at us. Mark, just to prove that this is live. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mark is in Rotterdam, and not with us in the studio here. Mark will take over shortly, but of course, allow me an introduction of Mark Schadeberg. Mark Schadeberg worked for six years for the Public Prosecution Service in the Netherlands, before joining the Department of Criminal Law and Criminology at the Free University in Amsterdam. His PhD in Social Sciences on the Workings of Security Assemblages in Urban Environments was awarded the triannual Willem Nagel Prize by the Dutch Society of Criminology. This was in 2012. In the fields of criminology and philosophy, Mark's expertise and areas of interest include politics and crime control, policing, surveillance, algorithms, big data, and smart cities. He is the author of three books, including the before-mentioned Hysteria, 2021, the Securitization of Society, Crime, Risk, and Social Order, 2015, and the one book that got me on his track, published in 2006, written in his free time, Mediapolis, and he's an editor of a whole list of books that I'm not going to mention here. Um, Mark is teaching in Amsterdam, living in Rotterdam, and I don't know where he does this in the train, but he is an editor for a series of magazines. The Journal on Culture and Criminality, in Dutch, Tijdschrift over Cultuur en Criminaliteit, and of the magazine Judicial Explorations, in Dutch, Justitiële Verkenningen. He writes columns for the Dutch Daily NSA Handelsblad, themed Justice and Injustice, his university's free magazine, Advalvas, and the Dutch magazine, Social Questions. He also used to be a very regular contributor to Gonzo Circus, connecting the realms of culture and, let's say, his more academic sides. Mark is a member of the Board of Advice of Holland Security Group. He is also a member of the governing board of the Complaints Bureau for Discrimination in Amsterdam. Uh, for those people that did some research before actually coming to this show, and checking out Mark on Twitter. Indeed, he's a fervent supporter of Sparta Rotterdam, the most classic football club in the Netherlands. In his most recent book, Hysteria, Crime, Media and Politics, Mark argues that our societies are characterized by a moral overdrive. He sees social media as key players helping to spread the infection of hysteria. This hysteria has consequences on various levels. Mark will touch on those various levels in his presentation, in which he will also deal with two statements we ask him to react to. The first one being, hysteria is more than a medical issue. And the second one, we must find ways to show resilience in the face of hysteria. 
So as said, Mark will start with the presentation, then Michelle and I will have the honor to ask some questions. As Michelle introduced, we can also bring your questions forward to Mark. Um, and they might touch on many things. Corona policies, their consequences, CCTV in our streets, the rise of political right-wing populism, the many ways we don't feel citizens in our home cities anymore. But all of that, after Mark's presentation, um, allow us, Mark, to invite you to the screen and start your presentation. Mark Schalenburg, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I will talk now briefly uh, about my book, uh, Hysteria. In the 1980s, uh, hysteria stopped uh, being treated as a medical disorder. And that was the date it was removed from the DSM Handbook of Mental Disorders and ceased to be considered a medical condition. But we need only look around us to see that hysteria has never been more alive. Just consider the run on toilet paper at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic. Despite authorities stressing there's no shortage, photos of bare shelves and public police to leave behind a few rolls for other shoppers were overflowing social media. Or think of the consumer hysteria every Black Friday, where people storm the high street en masse in a franchised hunt for bargains. They camp outside department stores until the doors open and they all squeeze in at once, trampling over each other, only to find that many of the bargains are not the deals they are cracked up to be. Think also about the overheated discussions on Facebook and Twitter over issues such as security and immigration. People do not believe things are getting any better at all and distrust government statistics, which they believe show biased results. A large part of the population have serious concerns about society going downhill, talking about the hooliganization of society and the decline of community spirit. They project their worries onto groups and institutions coming from abroad and that don't belong into our biotope. Immigrants, Muslims and the European Union have all come under fire. We all recognize hysteria, the display of over-the-top emotions when we see it. In fact, no sooner than it left the DSM handbook, hysteria seems to have migrated to every other sphere of our society. No longer a medical condition, it has become the business model of the neoliberal age. What roles do politicians and social media taking in spreading or calming down hysteria? What lessons can hysteria teach us about the societies we live in today? In short, the question of tonight, why are our lives, which seem to run so smoothly for many people, nevertheless so hysterical? Medical and historical researchers, psychoanalysts and philosophers, religious and gender studies scholars, as well as painters and writers, have all grappled with hysteria and tried to unravel its mysteries. From ancient Egyptian times until deep into the 18th century, hysteria was diagnosed as a, as a convulsive disorder, caused by what was called a wandering womb, which was believed to move freely through the body all the way into the head, emitting toxic fumes that led to hysteria. The word hysteria comes from the ancient Greek hysterica and the Latin hystericus, which means pertaining to the uterus and is derived from hustera, which means womb. It is based on the belief that hysteria is caused by the womb traveling through the female body, triggering a host of different symptoms on its way. This idea of the womb going astray dates back to the ancient Egyptians. In one of the oldest pieces of medical writing in existence, a papyrus from Cahun, dating from 1900 before Christ, all female medical complaints are attributed to a wandering womb. On Mondays, the womb is thought to settle in the throat, cutting off the air supply. On Tuesdays, it latches onto the heart, causing vomiting. On Wednesdays, it picks on the liver, making the woman lose her voice and grind her teeth, and turning her face ashen. And on Thursday, it is inside the head, resulting in headaches and pain around the eyes. This view changed in the course of the Middle Ages, when hysteria was increasingly considered a moral problem. Women suffering from a serious form of hysteria were thought to be possessed by devils and demons. Hysterical women were no longer ill, but the victims, or worse, handmaidens of the devil. 
Their bodies were possessed by some evil demon as a punishment for committing sins. In the 20th century, Sigmund Freud's work popularized, popularized the study of hysteria from a psychoanalytic perspective. Ideas like the Oedipus complex, in which hysterical behavior is caused by a girl's guilty feelings about her sexual attraction to her father, have now become irrelevant. But the theory of Freud that still resonates is that hysteria is caused by traumatic events that cannot be put into words and are expressed instead through bodily complaints. And finally, in the 1970s and 1980s, feminist thinkers such as Helene Sizou and Lucia Iregari turned sexist views of hysteria on their heads, rebranding hysteria as a female system of meaning outside official languages and cultural conventions. They considered hysterical symptoms to be a rebellion against the social and institutional order of our society, which restricts women's freedom. Although there are countless possible explanations for hysteria, we tend to ignore the social link between individual stories and the big picture. And yet, as I show in my new book, Hysteria, hysteria has as much to do with wider political, economic and cultural changes in society as it does with the individual. Examining the hysterical processes we are seeing now and how they are being fueled by a culture that not only encourages and enjoys, but also abuses and rewards it, I think can tell us something about why people seem increasingly to fall prey to it. So let us look closer at these political, economic and cultural changes in our society, because more than any other illness, hysteria seems to follow the movements of the changing organizational structure of society and mirrors the culture of a certain period. And this is clearly shown by the history of hysteria. In 1892, the Austrian physicist Max Nordau wrote in his book Antarctica that the growing number of cases of hysteria at the end of the century were down to exhaustion caused by the rapid development of modern society. He argued in his book that Western society was haunted, and I cite him, by a black plague of degeneration and hysteria. And Nordau describes an unhealthy fin de secular feeling marked by the acceleration of technological change. Age-old traditions and stories were pushed out by new media, such as the telephone and the telegraph, which brought people together who had previously been far apart. And daily life was further intensified by the invention of the steam train, the gramophone, the film, as well as the spectacular growth of cities, all of which brought people in touch with new sounds, new images and new worldviews. Everything, you could also argue, that had once been small and familiar became large and overwhelming, creating a void of security and belonging against which the body, which the body revolted through hysteria. Nowadays, we are again seeing a steep decline of a primal sense of security, the social glue of society. Globalization has cranked the speed of life into a new gear. In many countries, Anglo-Saxon neoliberalism has replaced social democracy since the 1970s, leading to a loss of solidarity and over-individualization, raising questions such as, who am I? Where do I belong? How important is my culture? At the same time, there is ever less space in our societies for community or communal identity. Social meeting spaces, ranging from public libraries to corner shops, have disappeared or been replaced by corporate change. These palaces for the people, as sociologist Eric Kleinenberg calls them, they reinforce public familiarity in a neighborhood by allowing people to make connections, to help another, to offer refuge to those who feel excluded or diminished elsewhere. And the lack of a sense of belonging, often accompanied, of course, by feelings of fear, frustration and anger, I think is a recurrent factor in current outbreaks of hysteria. You could also argue that the sense of security that already originates inside the womb and is etymologically linked to the old Greek hysterikos is in danger of slowly but surely disappearing. In that respect, life has arguably returned to how it was in the late 19th century Europe. 
Not that society is the same as it was in the time of Sigmund Freud and Max Nordau. Too much has changed since then, but there are undoubtedly some of very striking similarities. If the 21st century could lie on the analyst's couch, the question to explore tonight would be what is making us hysterical? Where hysteria used to be a medical condition, we can now think of it as our area's business model. It works by playing on these feelings of lack and insecurity. And social media is probably the most obvious case in point. Facebook business model is focused on offering a platform, platform to frustration and anger, emotions that are infectious and in combination with uncertainty often lead to extreme reactions. The more hysterical you post, the more clicks and views you generate and the greater the advertising revenue for Facebook is. Anyone wanting to be heard in today's social media world needs to use words like unacceptable and staggering. This also goes for other social media, including Twitter, which would go bankrupt tomorrow without hysteria. At the same time, Facebook and Twitter are increasingly viewed as addictive, and with good reason. Research shows that the chemical dopamine, also known as the happy hormone, is released in our brains when we are successful on social media. Getting lots of likes on Facebook or followers on Twitter activates the reward circuit in all of our brain, while uncertainty strikes when we are unfollowed on Twitter or Facebook, making us feel empty. I think that it is possible that this void or a feeling of lack is inherent to the human condition. It is this sense of lack that has driven human development, bringing us wealth and progress. But the market economy thrives off and magnifies this feeling of a void in our existence that cries out to be filled. Nothing is ever enough. Four words that summarize today's neoliberal economic order. The experienced economy, which is based on the premise that reality is the way people perceive it, expertly deploys advertising and exposure to stimulate consumers' desires by creating a feeling of need. The launch of every new iPhone sends us running to Apple stores in a crazed frenzy, even though everyone knows the difference between the old and the new version in no way justifies the expense. I can get no satisfaction, as an old man once said. Even if we obtain the thing we desire, it will only satisfy us temporarily. Because no single object, experience or person can fully satisfy the lack that lies at the root of our desire, which is constantly recreated in the consumer economy. The same is true for politics, the third area. We might not think of politics as having a business model as such, but politicians constantly draw on society's potential for hysteria, selling citizens both the hysteria itself and the solutions to it. Take the issue of public safety. Citizens are liable to get incredibly worked up about the issue of security and respond with vehemence to what is seen as a non-committal attitude to crime characterizing their country. As a consequence, political discussions about public safety tend to end in the unanimous conclusion that more decisiveness is needed to solve all problems for good. Such policies are spoken of in historical terms and with a preference for a macho military vocabulary. The war on Corona, the war on drugs, the war on terror. Sent in the troops, a Republican senator wrote in an opinion piece in the New York Times in which he advocated using the military to kill the unrest in American cities sparked by the brutal killing of George Floyd by police officers on May 2020. Once a diagnosis of law and order problem has been made, we are flooded by a veritable tsunami of new punitive measures, only for the cycle to be repeated. But all of this stands in stark contrast to the fact that crime rates in Western countries have fallen spectacularly for years. In the Netherlands, for instance, registers and victim reported crime has dropped by about 30% since 2001, and the number of offenses it has its lowest point in almost 40 years. And this applies to all types of offenses, ranging from car theft to burglary and from robberies to vandalism, while the number of homicides has more than halved in the past decade. And this is not only true for the Netherlands, 
The same pattern can be discerned in other European countries and the United States. In other words, the punitive populism that is pushing ever more stringent security policies is completely out of kilter with the actual surveillance measures to improve in safety and security. When exploited as a business model, hysteria brings misery. But hysteria can also have the power to turn the world upside down, just like the hysterical, uncontrolled laughter, laughter of the Joker in Todd Phillips' movie becomes a call to finish off today's rampant neoliberalism after the Joker loses his medication and counseling because of budget cuts. In the 19th century, women started politicizing their bodies to revolt against the suffocating conventions of the Victorian era. And while this hysteria led to many of his sufferers being institutionalized, it also produced social reforms aimed at giving women the same rights and opportunities as men. The tighty laced corset disappeared, making space for more liberal views on marriage, on sexuality and the right to work. And this is not hysteria in its most destructive, sinister form, in which people will tear and tear off their clothes and pull out their hair. I'm talking now about the more constructive hysteria which sets things in motion. And constructive hysteria is an engine for change, a way of making a contribution to the world. It acts for the greater good rather than out of self-interest. It seems to me that certain issues nowadays should be treated then with a little less hysteria, while others could do with some more. No one is raising the alarm over the fact that 14.3 million of the UK's 66.4 million inhabitants live in the institution, including 4.6 million children. Nor does anyone seem to be worried about a large part of this group being homeless. At the same time, ego barbarism is still running rampant. Roughly 1 million of the estimated 8 million plant and animal species on Earth are threatened with extinction, in many cases within a time from ranging from a few years to a couple of decades. As David Wallace Wells puts in his book The Uninhabitable Earth, here the facts are hysterical. While the planet is hurtling towards its demise, the debate about global warming revolves around how much it will cost to go on living the way we are now and includes painstaking calculations of exactly how much money needs to be spent on measures to preserve the planet as well as our lifestyle. This reduces an ecological issue to a bookkeeping problem to be resolved by a flight tax here and energy subsidy there. The real issue that we need to develop a complete new ecological awareness as well as a new and more inclusive understanding of such matters as damage, care and responsibility is not addressed. So to come to a conclusion, you could argue instead that the sheer scale and disastrous effects of both issues should justify a hysterical gesture. One fueled not by profit and not by power, but by the human need for survival and togetherness. Silence and inaction are no longer options. We do, after all, live in an hysterical world and you all know. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Mark. To wow. perhaps <laughs> continue where you left us with your presentation on the, the strikes for climate, the, the school strikes as started by Greta Thunberg. One of the first reactions to her being the leader of a global movement was, first of all, she's very young. And secondly, she's just a hysterical girl. What did you think about that when you were reading this in the media? Now, it, it pointed me back to, um, to, the, uh, to the still uh, opinion about hysteria, that only women can be hysterical. Uh, hysteria was always a very stigmatizing disease. Um, at, the, it, at the end of the 18th century, it a little bit changed because uh, men were then diagnosed by hypochondria, but still until this day, when uh, women take the lead or act in a yeah, kind of way we don't like, we still tend to call them uh, hysterical. Uh, so in that way, it's still 
shows that the old meaning uh, and the completely, of course, silly meaning of hysteria uh, still uh, yeah, exists, still takes place in our society. At the same time, when I look at Greater Turnback, it makes me very proud to see such a young girl taking this responsibility and to take so much other kids uh, on the streets uh, for a cause that I think could use uh, much hysteria, as I said. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> just to continue yeah. a little bit on this gender-biased uh, hysteria as a definition, most people that were defining Greta Thunberg as a hysterical young girl were, of course, um, like you and me, middle-aged white yeah. men um, in rather good positions to actually belittle somebody by calling that person hysterical. Did then nothing change ever since the end of the 19th century? Yeah, you see the, uh, that I pause for such a long time. Um, I, I'm afraid I must say, and I, I also show that in my lecture about uh, what, what Max Norda already uh, writing, what happened at the, uh, at the end of the 19th century, and what's happening now in many ways, uh, I think there are a lot of similarities, uh, negative and positive similarities. So, um, yeah, to answer your question, um, of course, we're not back in the 19th century, but I think many of the similarities who took place then, and I showed already uh, the scale of the cities, bringing in all kinds of new media, I think we see some similarities of these movements taking place also now. So in that way, I think, yeah, we're back in the 19th century, although I realize that the 21st century is, of course, completely different. But in the end, you must always, I think, realize um, things don't change very fast. Uh, if you look at the history of hysteria, as I show in my book, it started already in 1900 before Christ, this first meaning of a lack of security, a lack of belonging. And I think still that this meaning of a lack of security, a lack of belonging, that started when the wound was all over the women's body, that some of these symptoms are still true. Of course, the wandering wound is, uh, is, is ludicrous. Uh, uh, um, uh, but some of um, the connotations of the wound, of feeling safe, of feeling secure, I think nowadays with the globalization, with the neoliberal age, I think this is uh, again at stake. One, one sentence. So in, in this way, so in this way, um, uh, you can use hysteria, and, and uh, I try to show that in my book, as a sensitizing concept, concept, a sensitizing concept. Excuse me, and uh, not that I can pinpoint at she is hysterical or he's hysterical, but it's a sensitizing concept to show why these over-the-top reactions, uh, why they are occurring nowadays, uh, at such fast speed. Uh, uh, and what's, what kind of symptoms on a political and a cultural and economic uh, area we can combine uh, by looking at these reactions. Because it's always the both. It's the individual reaction, but the individual reaction in that way, I think Freud was right, always responds to an underlying political, cultural or economic change. Yeah, because that might be also a question you in your presentation you you mentioned uh, very disparate examples from run to toilet paper to our reaction on social media to uh, the fear we have of of, of the other of criminality. Um, where do you draw the line? When is something hysterical and and one when not and. What can yeah. what else can it be? Is a, any emotional reaction is is hysterical, or I'm I'm trying to 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 understand where yeah. where where you can still call something hysterical? Yeah, uh, um, um, yeah. First of all, it's very difficult uh, to give a precise definition of hysteria, uh, as I show in my book from 1900 before Christ till this day, uh, people still struggle to give an exact meaning of hysteria. But on the other way, we also talk about neoliberalism or fascism, uh, also without having a very tight definition. So I don't think it's a problem that the word does not have a tight or exact definition. Uh, many words, as we know by the philosophy of language, don't have an exact definition that is the same in time on every place on earth and so on. So I don't think that's the problem. But you're right, 
in some way, as a sensitizing concept, you have to have a broad idea how to look at some events uh, um, and, and some uh, yeah, uh, behavior. And in my book, uh, uh, I emphasize uh, the extraordinarily overwrought tone in which people express themselves on the one hand, in combination with conflicts about political and moral issues that gave uh, rise to it, uh, such as in my book, security or immigration issues. So the combination of both, uh, I tend to see or I deal with it as historical uh, events or historical behavior. But, but you're right, it's very difficult to pinpoint an exact definition. I think that was also one of the reasons it's now left out of the DSM handbook. Uh, because even in the medical world, uh, we tend to recognize it, although it's impossible to give an exact definition of it. But like I said, that's with many sociological terms, even with neoliberalism or fascism and so on. Yeah, even though it becomes quite interesting when you think about uh, the kind of instrumentalization of hysteria you were talking about, where it, when it becomes a business model. So, and and there it might become interesting to see when when is it really, uh, yeah, or really, <laughs> there's not such a thing as real hysteria, but when is it hysteria, when is it maybe other things that have to do with emotions? Yeah. Now, it, uh, I, like, uh, I show in my book uh, the difference, for instance, between hysteria and panic. Uh, and I try to show also the difference between hysteria and hypochondria. But still, uh, yeah, uh, you're right. Um, it was impossible for me, although I spent more a year in archives to looking for an exact definition, <laughs> to exactly define what is hysteria. Still, until this day, uh, from, like I said, from 1900 before Christ till this day, people still argue about it. So in this way, I thought I treat it in the most common sense as an overwrought reaction, but always in combination then with the larger issue. Uh, because my book is in the end about uh, uh, becoming the business model of a neoliberal age. It's in the end about politics, about economy, about the feeling of security, of liveability in cities and so on. So then, if I may ask a question turning that side, when you were referring to Max Nordau and you were saying that perhaps the acceleration of culture and the end of the 19th century, a lot of people were meeting people and perhaps also meeting institutions that they were not meeting before. And then yeah. falling in a void of saying, who am I when I am meeting these people? Um, how important am I in meeting these people? And one of the chapters in your book is called So You Think You Can Participate. And I think there's a direct line from that part where you are meeting people that you are normally not meeting to suddenly being expected to participate. But as you also made clear, this participation doesn't come free. You always need to participate on the terms of that person inviting you to participate. Maybe you could extend on this a little bit. Yeah, I, for my book, uh, my book is not only theoretical, uh, it's in a large part also empirical. And um, in that part of the book, uh, so you think you can participate, there's a little bit of a joke about so you think you can dance or so you think you can mm -hmm. sing. Uh, I, I, I took a part of a new initiative in the south of Rotterdam. That is one of the areas in Rotterdam, which is the most poor uh, area of our city in which people of um, uh, the south of them have a say in which um, topics the police and the municipality should tackle. And as a criminologist, I thought in the south of Rotterdam, where the problems are drugs, uh, uh, organized crime, uh, a lot of weapons, I thought the citizens came with the usual topics, drugs, uh, crime, uh, weapons, uh, and so on. But then there were other issues they were afraid of. They were said, well, it's loitering youth, it's the speeding of the cars that we have an issue with. So that was first my first um, reaction as a criminologist. I thought, well, I always teach my students about crime, about drugs, about weapons and so on. Uh, but <laughs> the citizens nice have, total other, uh, yeah, <laughs> have total other worries about their head. Uh, and when I asked them uh, what was the reason, they all said, yeah, this Rotterdam South, this part of the city, uh, this is part of the neighborhood, so if it yeah, don't heat up, I'm okay with it. 
But in the answer to back to your question, uh, the municipality said, well, uh, give us your free uh, issues and then we're going to tackle them. But then everything went wrong. Uh, these citizens uh, yeah, could not cooperate with the municipality. The municipality said, you can't have this, you can't have that. And in the meetings, I was every month, I was there for two years, I saw that the discussions became overheated and overheated and overheated because the citizens did, did not feel uh, the trust and uh, the trust of the municipality of taking decisions in their own neighborhood. And it shows to me um, that sociological speaking, while hysteria is yeah, always discussed in emotional terms, it showed that this has consequences in everyday life. Because at the first meeting, there were around 15 or 20 people. But in the final meeting, only three uh, citizens were still meeting there, the municipality and the police. They all left uh, the building, you could say. <laughs> and then you were referring to the book of Eric Leinenberg, Palaces for the People. And for those people that don't know the book, it is a case study into what keeps societies together, we might summarize perhaps uh, yeah. he's talking about social fabric a lot so yeah. how people on the individual level or on a community level are being bound together and that this helps in his book it is about yeah. i think the death rate during a heat wave in chicago somewhere in beginning of yeah. last century yeah, it's a beautiful book yeah but then might also this sense of community and I'm getting back to your question on meeting people that you are not normally meeting or that you are never meeting, that our sense of community is lost and thus our social fabric in the eyes of many people is eroding. Yeah, yeah I think that is one of the main reasons, at least in my diagnosis of hysteria, uh, why hysteria pops up uh, in, in these areas. Uh, today there's really a lack of a sense of belonging, a lack of security. Um, and that is a recurrent factor, I think, in current outbreaks of hysteria. If you look at political issues like security or immigration politics. Uh, and if you look at um, politics, I think what's the main issue at, at this moment is that a right populism or the right wing po politics, they do have an answer for this lack of security, this lack of belonging. And this solution to right populism is very simple. Look at uh, former President Donald Trump. That is to raise walls or raise high fences and let nobody in. But I think that politics need to focus again on strengthening this feeling of security, not in a negative way, but much more in a positive way. In a positive way, uh, not by high fences of high walls, uh, but uh, by putting in all kinds of positive measures. Uh, strengthening empathy, strengthening uh, trust, because trust binds also people. It brings also people together. And then allow me one more question, because I know we also are taking time from people that are viewing us uh, that would also like to pose some questions. It might be one of the most difficult things not to bring about trust among people. Um, so how could politicians or those people working in media or those people working in advertisement companies if we're talking about consumerism how could they actually as you say practice constructive hysteria and try to bring about trust rather than distrust well it, it, i think it, it first starts with the language you use uh, um, nowadays we are in a war against everything we are in a war against Corona, as the, as the French president used to call it. We are in a war against terror. We are in a war against crime. We are in a war against drugs. I think a lot of... Uh, it starts all already with framing things, uh, uh, using a different type of language. And this language does not to be confused with soft language. Yeah? Then it's still um, uh, the division between hard of expressive language and soft language. I think um, politicians can start using a different frame, uh, start to establish again this uh, uh, new trust, uh, start establishing again from the ground to bring uh, all kinds of uh, meeting places back in neighborhoods, which are totally, if I look at my neighborhood here in Rotterdam, 
uh, were tot- they are totally gone. And I think that is the big issue with hysteria, at least from a political uh, or economic motive. We have to bring back in a positive way this trust and this feeling of being together in our society back. Because if I look at Rotterdam or the place where I live, in a, in a square kilometer here lives more than 160 different uh, nationalities in one neighborhood. So this is an imme- a huge task for politicians, but also for the municipality. How to live together with more than 160 nationalities in one area in a city. And I think it starts then on the ground with really simple measures by uh, another language, by uh, raising uh, buildings or, 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 or centers where can, people can meet each other, can talk to each other and uh, stop using this purely repressive nonsense, repressive measures, but also think about other measures. Uh, like I said, um, not everything revolves around combating insecurity, pulling up weeds. I think it's also a matter of planting and promoting all kinds of positive factors of community, such as care, uh, trust and cooperation. And I think that's the big goal, even also for left politics, because still left politics don't want to talk about these words, about belonging to a nation or belonging to a community. They still confuse it with uh, blut and boden, eh? the, the discourse mm. of, of the right populism. But I think you can also look in a different way to belonging. I think because in the end, like I said, it's a matter of planting and promoting all kind of positive factors of community um, to give people again a feeling of security, which they totally lost in our neoliberal age with globalization, with immigration issues and all kind of other problems. And the coronavirus is, of course, uh, the most perfect example of it's invisible. It's coming from um, uh, outside. Uh, and it's taking us down. Yeah. But then again, talking in terms of war does not uh, have a solution. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting and problematic as well, because of course, like fear or hate are uh, emotions that are much easier to communicate and that sell more, if you want, since we're talking about business yeah. models, much more yeah. than, uh, than love, for instance, or caring, or uh, so that there is a, there is a big, I mean, there is a challenge, I mean... Just a bit of love here, sorry. Yeah, of course. And, um, but then another question about this idea of constructive hysteria. So you're basically making a distinction about this kind of hysteria that is very much used to, to get people afraid and, and, and emotional and reacting irrationally and with even more fear. And at the other hand, a more constructive hysteria that is for a better purpose. Can we still call this hysteria? Is this still irrational enough and emotional enough? Well, this is hysteria. Uh, this is and a you're question right. from uh, Monza, by the way, and Anke. Yeah, very good question. Uh, it's a very good question. It, it's, uh, at the end of my book, I, I want to, uh, at least that was my goal, uh, to turn the image of hysteria upside down. Uh, because, like I said, hysteria was always a stigmatizing term. It was only allocated for women. Uh, so I deal with it in most of my books. But in the end, I, I like to turn it upside down. And I like to turn it upside down to show that, according to me, and this is very personal, that, for instance, in the Netherlands, in 2021, in one of the most wealthiest countries in the world, there are approximately nowadays still 400,000 people who are analphabetic. And this, uh, yeah, it, it freaks me out that I live in a country where still a half million inhabitants have difficulties to read or to write. So at the end of my book, um, and, and this is more personal, like the eco barbarism I talked about and these um, uh, issues of uh, people who can't read or have difficulties to read and write, I said this, these topics can do with much more hysteria, but then hysteria, of course, in in a very broad term that we have to make more fuss about it, that Mm -hmm. politicians have to take uh, measures to combat, uh, I I, I use the word combat now, to combat these kind of issues, because these kind of issues are for me much more important than the issues of criminality, because like I said, uh, criminality is going down since 2001 till now. We live in one of the most safest countries in the world. So why still focusing on these issues 
which are no real issues according to my vision and not issues uh, like I told you, like ego barbarism or that people have difficulties to write or to read or, or can't sleep in houses, uh, live in destitution and so on. But then if I may, because I'm re reacting to your use of the word combating, the, the words that we use to actually talk about, let's say, building these communities of care or bringing about a culture of, of care and trust, um, you said we need to combat that culture of fear and we need to perhaps call out to politicians so that they will be rea reacting to this. But that might be just those little tricks that the neoliberal age has taught us. Yeah, loud. Um, so how can we, by acting as a community of care, try to not use, let's say, the tools of those people that have made our world hysterical? How would we do that? It's a million dollar question, but mm -hmm. I just thought I'd throw yeah. it up. Yeah, but I don't think we can uh, uh, turn the system upside down. Uh, I think we're stuck into this neoliberal age. Um, so why don't we use the weapons they use in our own advantage? Uh, that would be uh, my solution. Uh, see how they react, how they respond, and use the same tactics, but then in other goals and with other means for other topics. And this is closely related, um, as I show in my book, um, like I told you about the womb, eh? that is the most old definition of hysteria, that the womb of the women goes in their body all the way to the arms, to the head, uh, to the feet, and so on. And of course, nobody takes this uh, diagnosis any serious anymore. But still, the womb is the place where we feel most safe um, uh, in our lives. It's the most safest place we have ever lived in, the womb. And I think we're still looking again for new places where we feel safe when we leave the womb, eh? where, where we are out uh, of the body of our mother. And if you look into the word of security, as I show you, that in the Dutch word of security, which was written uh, three, four hundred years ago as Felig, there are two connotations of this word. So one word is in what you told me just is, is the hysterical of combating crime and combating insecurity. But in the old word of security, which goes back already to this feeling of being in the womb, this old word of security uh, means also trust, feeling home at a place, or what the English so much, uh, such beautiful say, a sense of belonging. That was the old uh, meaning of the word security in the Dutch language. It's the same in the Swedish language. It's the same in the German language, but it's not in the English language, in the English word for security. But in the Swedish word, in the German word, and in the Dutch word, there's also a much more positive connotation. And I think that you can do both things. Then, of course, you have to combat crime, the negative definition of security, but you could also and that's the opposite, and then I'm coming back to this uh, issue of hysteria, you can also promote or work on these positive fa factors of security, and that is care, trust, uh, uh, feeling of uh, a, a sense of belonging. And I think that's in the end uh, the goal, to use the tactics of this age, but use them in a different way for other meanings and maybe for other topics. So then here's a question from... Monse, again, mm -hmm. who's asking on memes. So the quick way of reproducing difficult facts in a, well, let's say, in catchy way on the internet and the way how they are quickly reproduced, would you consider them to be hysterical or would you consider them to be useful tools in spreading this call for a community of care? I think, yeah, it, it can do both. I think it can do both. Uh, uh, in one way, these memes or, or in a broader, uh, in a broader uh, all kind of statistics, all kind of fact sheets or, or other things. In one way, you, people tend not to believe them. Yeah? They say, uh, uh, I don't believe this uh, crime is going down, for instance. But on the other hand, I think, yeah, maybe you could, as a politician, you still also have the decency and I think also the responsibility to keep telling people, to keep telling people what the facts are. Uh, because in the end, yeah, there's no other position you can do. But also acknowledging 
uh, the emotions that are part of it. And uh, we rationalize uh, in the past decades the whole issue of politics, uh, uh, economy and so on. But these emotions are also a part of it. It was also the reason why I wrote this book. Um, once in a while, uh, I'm on the Dutch uh, journal uh, the, on, uh, or in a, in a newspaper. And when I tend to, uh, to tell on television that, for instance, we live in the most safest country in the world, the other day I receive, and I'm not exaggerating here, I receive, I think, like 20 or 30 emails. And those emails are longer than the average essay of my students. And all the, <laughs> all the emails have the same... Uh, angle that I am uh, a lunatic, uh, that I uh, must be forbidden to teach at a university and so on. But when I write these people back, and I always write them back, uh, then a the communication starts, then the trust starts, and then they always respond with uh, the same line. Oh, thank you very much for your answer. I, normally, I never get an answer from a professor when I email one. And then you have a communication, and then you can tell exactly the same message because I tell exactly the same message then by email instead of on television. And then a dialogue starts. And I think then really a lot of changing already on the most micro level there is possible in a community, changing okay. emails with each other. Isn't that exactly an example where you basically step a bit out of this hysterical and you, you're basically saying to that person, I'm, I, I heard you, I read your email, uh, yeah, I you see take, you're you here, take, yeah. I see your problem, yeah. and I'm responding yeah. in, a, in a rational way, maybe. So, um, yeah, maybe. Yeah. In the end, of course, in a rational way, because yeah, I'm still a professor. Uh, but, but I take their emotions uh, very seriously. Mm -hmm. I do not throw their emotions out of the place. And what we now tend to do, we, for instance, uh, fact check. Uh, fact check is to only look at what's rational, what are the facts, and tend to dismiss the emotions who are also a part and which also fabricate social order. Mm -hmm. So you have to do both. You have to take their emotions, I think, in the end, very seriously. Uh, but again, uh, yeah, in the end, you have to show mm -hmm. the facts, of course. Yeah. We have one more very interesting question also about emotions and actually... Um yeah, a field where emotion play a very, very big role. Uh, this question is from Anke. She asks, would the stock market not be maybe the most accurate example of how hysteria would work as a business model in our society? Or that we're basically living in a kind of stock market where we are being dragged by our emotions up and down in a matter no, of seconds. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's a great remark, yeah. yeah the, the example is also in my book. It's maybe, it's, that's the business model of our age, yeah, the stock market, the, the hysteria, or the Bitcoin market, or the crypto market, or in the Netherlands nowadays, the housing market. You see it everywhere. It's the same way how they develop, how they get peaked and go down and so on, yeah. yeah. But this is a great remark. That's true, yeah. But that you see, that, you and see that, 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 and that's the point also of my book. Uh, that hysteria stopped to be a medical diagnosis. It stopped to be a medical uh, disease. It has become uh, the business model. So it's not a medical model anymore. It has become the business model how society functions. Exactly in the stock market, in the housing market, in the crypto market, in the Bitcoin market, on Black Friday and so on. Yeah. And then maybe <coughs> it might be a small step sideways. <laughs> But in one of your first comments on the corona pandemic, and I think it was in a blog post for Yob, Dutch website, you quoted Yuval Noah Harari, who said that a lot of people, including himself, are actually afraid that corona might help those tendencies in society to get to a totalitarian surveillance state, where all of us citizens will be homo transparentus. But the stock market or the housing market are examples of, let's say, society in transparentus. I don't get anything of stock markets nor the housing market, and maybe I'm not alone in this room. I hope so. No. Um, so then, what is this relation between a homo transparentus and a system that we do not understand? 
Het is homo transparentus. Uh, it is the old way of looking at uh, humanity. So the, 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 the old way of looking at humanity was the homo clausus. Clausure means uh, uh, locking up people. Uh, but this homo clausus uh, changed from homo clausus to homo transparentus, I think. And you see that we have a lot of surveillance measures taking place nowadays. From predictive policing, where they predict if someone will commit a murder, to other kind of uh, surveillance measures. Yeah, the ultimate goal of our neoliberal, uh, neoliberal age is making things transparent. Not only um, as an effective way of combating, uh, for instance, crime, but it's also a moral issue. A politician, take for instance uh, Mark Rutte, needs to be transparent nowadays. Uh, so it is also a, a moral issue in itself being transparent. It means you're doing good if you're transparent. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you're right. There are a lot of um, fields uh, who don't want to be transparent, uh, who yeah, in, in some way profit from the, uh, yeah, the upside down, the other uh, side of the coin. But, but I think in a lot of ways, transparent uh, was a very old word for looking through. Eh? Glass was transparent. It is now taking a much more moral issue. If you're not transparent, you have something to hide. That also shows in the way surveillance measures are becoming now exaggerated or becoming more and more in this corona uh, pandemic. And then, of course, in the end, yeah, it's the question if we are uh, taking them down, if they're going away, uh, I'm afraid not. No, and then let's say our state of exception will become the normal state the normal. until we, we get to new exceptions. Yeah, yeah. But there is one, um, one premise I like to make there. Uh, a lot of people use this word state of exception of ungomben. But in a lot of ways, I think the coronavirus was a true state of exception uh, in a way that uh, uh, we needed measures to combat the coronavirus. So I'm not in favor of using this word exception for all kind of topics. Uh, <coughs> even uh, senators uh, in the US, conservative senators claim to be in a state of exception nowadays with Joe Biden in power. So there is a devaluation of the word, but I, can, I think that in a lot of ways the coronavirus uh, yeah, we had to take these measures. But the problem is that uh, these measures, once they are taken, nobody withdraw them anymore. That's always the problem with technology and with all kinds of measures. But there was here a real issue. Let's, not fa let's face that. There was a real issue. There still is a real issue with Corona. So, um, yeah, and people yeah, we get have used. You can get used. You can get step by step, you can get further and further. Uh, once you put up a measure, then slowly um, calms yeah, down. Yeah, get accustomed by it. Yeah, and you see now with the Corona app and the Corona passport was now taking place, it leads to new divisions in society. It takes up new questions. Uh, am I allowed to go to a restaurant, which in many options is still some kind of public place. So what's public, what's private? All these questions are now popping up, I think in the coming uh, decades uh, as to the measures taken. Uh, due to the coronavirus pandemic. Yeah. But that is maybe exactly also, I'm just thinking out loud, what, what hysteria is about, about merging this public and private maybe. Uh, hysteria is something that has to do with the emotion, with the inner, with the womb, and, and, and you're just bringing it out where it shouldn't be, actually. Uh, so maybe it is very much about this coming together. Maybe I'm just uh, <laughs> taking it a step too far, but I don't know, I was triggered by this uh, public-private. Yeah, no, it, it, it takes things together, uh, like I, uh, I told you. Uh, yeah, it, it takes things of the individual with the bigger picture. So it brings down the individual or the homo clausus, what we talk about, mm -hmm. to bigger pictures and combines. In that way, still, I think Freud is relevant uh, to still read it. Eh? I read a lot of uh, the work of Sigmund Freud, and still, it's, it's a fascinating read, still. Uh, of course, you see the problems with how he dealt with women and the problems with the audio complex. I'm completely uh, familiar with that. But he also coined the term unheimlich, eh, that we feel constantly unheimlich, or in, in English, uncanny. And this whole notion of feeling uncanny, not feeling at home in our own neighborhood, in our uh, 
uh, let's say castle, I think this notion is still relevant uh, until this day. So <clears throat> we are slowly getting to an end of our well, interview, let's say like this. <laughs> um, Michelle announced there's a rooftop bar for people to have a discussion amongst each other. Mark, I don't know if you have been invited to join us on the rooftop bar too, but you are more than welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a castle, it's really, let's say... A cozy... <laughs> a cozy... Cozy, cozy bar. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it might serve as one of those places where you pleaded for, let's say, a community space where perhaps you can just enter without feeling urged to be something else than you are. Um, and where, if I understand you well, it might not be so important what it is that you will be doing or producing, but just the mere fact of being there. Now, being there and, and, and getting in a conversation, uh, the first step is always talk to each other. And like I said, in the neighborhood where I live here in Rotterdam, 160 nationalities live in a few square kilometers. And it is a huge task to bring these people together. And in the end, everything starts, I think, with seeing each other, communicating to each other, building up this notion of trust. Um, also, to get away with this hysteria about they are taking our place or they're raping our daughters or they're taking our jobs. All those hysterical reactions, for instance, that took place in the Netherlands uh, when the whole issue of immigration was uh, one of the most popular issues in politics. Yeah. So then, if we may conclude yeah, we by saying... Yeah, we hope you join us, because it's, um, there's much more to talk about, I would say. <laughs> and everybody who has been watching, thank you very much. Also, Mark, thank you so much for all the inspiring talk. And um, this was the third Impact TV episode. We are taking a summer break. Um, so we will be back with Impact TV on the 2nd of September. And uh, it will be a very nice Impact TV about um, surveillance, actually, DNA surveillance and biohacking. And um, on the 2nd of September, we will announce more details soon. Um, before that, uh, as you're seeing now on the slide, on the 26th of June, we have a symposium, Code and LD, and that is all about the power of big tech, privacy and digital rights and how can we together in dialogue talking to each other politicians citizens and artists uh, together tackle these things and it relates and i hope to see you all in the rooftop zoom bar you will find it on the rooftop on the top floor of planet impact thank you so much for watching thank you thank you very much time. bye